Hi, this is Lex, and welcome to the Fintech Blueprint. It's your podcast about fintech, decentralized finance, digital banking, investing, robo-advice, artificial intelligence, and all the other frontier technology that is transforming financial services. To get more content, like an illustrated transcript of this conversation in your inbox, subscribe at fintechblueprint.com. So without further delay, let's jump into today's episode. The content in this podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be taken as legal, business, tax, or investment advice, or used to evaluate any investment or security. It's also not directed at any investors or potential investors in any A16Z fund. For more details, check out a16z.com slash disclosures. Hi, everybody, and welcome to today's conversation. I'm thrilled to have with us Anisha Charya, who is a general partner at Andreessen Horowitz, the venture capital firm. And of course, we know Andreessen from a number of marquee investments in fintech, in Web3, and all across the space. And we'll talk largely about fintech today, as well as the industry and the competitive dynamics that have come in the markets. So with that, Anish, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me, Lex. Good morning. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world, to our audience as well. So let's start at your beginning and open up how you got into entrepreneurship and technology. You know, you have a very entrepreneurial background building businesses. What were some of those foundational experiences? What were the the early companies that you had tried to build and how did that go? Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Lex. So, you know, for me, I grew up in a tiny town in Ontario, Canada. And I think like many kids who grew up in these small towns, you sort of, you were always wondering what was, you know, outside of the small town, what was bigger than the small town, you know, and it was a nice place to grow up, but it was all very sort of monotone in terms of there was a certain set of things that people were interested in. There was a certain sort of archetype of person there is a definition for ambition, which was, you know, a lot more muted than I think the definition for ambition we have here in our Silicon Valley community. So I guess I've always been a curious person. You know, I got my first computer in the late 80s, and that's when I started experimenting with building things. And that's really when I fell in love with software. I, I built a bulletin board system, which was, of course, the precursor to the Internet called Shapeshifter BBS, and I got interested in trying to build games for my BBS. So at that time, there wasn't, you know, there wasn't an internet system. There was a sort of precursor to the internet. You can go to to the local college and use. You could go to the library and check books of source code out, which you could then program into your basic compiler, and, you know, that's how you played games. So it was obviously a very, very different era, but that sort of combination of, you know, wanting to to do things that were bigger than that small town, as well as, you know, just being curious about this this way of building things and technology came together in, you know, in my really early days and got me interested in technology and computing. There's quite a journey to go from building software for the first time and then taking the leap and building a company. How did you do that? What pulled you into entrepreneurship? I've always been interested in building, you know, companies and new technologies. So when I was in college, you know, we had to do a fourth year design project. Most folks' fourth year design project focused on something that was academic and, and moved the sort of, you know, body of academic work forward. I was much more interested in doing something that had commercial relevance. So I remember at the time, I, you know, me and my team ended up building a a modem that would plug into a digital camera via the compact flash slot. And that way you could take photos and have them be digitally, you know, real time transmitted. And, you know, we had all these ideas about how we were going to sell it to journalists working in war zones, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, we almost failed the project because the professor felt that it wasn't academically relevant enough. It was, you know, we were sort of indulging in a, in a fantasy of building something that was commercially viable We ended up not taking that product to market. I got a job at Amazon after, but Amazon was a great place to nurture that entrepreneurial spirit. It was still a very small company, at least relative to what it is today. And there was a ton of very motivated builders. And, you know, Amazon sort of famously had a culture where you didn't have to use any internal technologies. You could either build your own technology platform or you could buy something off the shelf. So it created a sort of culture amongst teams where everyone felt super empowered to 
do whatever they felt was best for their small team and their small business unit. You know, that experience at Amazon really set the tone for my career. So, you know, coming to the end of my time at Amazon, I was there for three or four years and, you know, I befriended one of the SVPs, this fellow Rick Dalzell, who's a really incredible leader and thinker. And at the time I I came to Rick's office for my monthly one-on-one and he said, Anish, you know, we've been meeting for three or four years now and you come in and you tell me about all these companies you want to build and all these things that are inspiring you. You know, why haven't you left yet? And I said, well, Rick, I don't know any angel investors And he said, I tell you what, I'm going to introduce you to three angel investors today. And if the next time you come into my office, it isn't to tell me that you've given notice and you're going to build a company, I'm going to fire you. So he did introduce me to three angel investors, you know, the folks at SV Angel amongst them. And I did give my notice and I decided to go build my first company. So that's really how I got started. You know, at the time, there was a lot happening in terms of new technology development with the web social platform. So the Facebook API was new. That was the first time you could really get a product to that kind of scale that quickly. So there was a ton of builders experimenting with it. And then having come from Waterloo, the University of Waterloo, and, you know, a mobile background, we were really interested in mobile as an emerging platform. You know, it had never been quite the right time for mobile. So it felt like The intersection of these two worlds was an interesting space to be operating in. You're looking at what was emerging with the social APIs on platforms like Facebook and trying to connect that with ideas for how the smartphone would be important. What were some of the things you were able to see in founding Social Deck? You mentioned Facebook APIs and behavioral patterns of using mobile phones. Like, what were some of the hypotheses at the time that you had, and how did they end up jiving with reality? Like, what were those trends that were exposed, and how did you take them on? I think we had both explicit and implicit assumptions. You know, our most explicit assumption was that the mobile phone was an obvious place for connected applications. You know, social networks are built on the web. They had built all of these primitives and capabilities that enabled, you know, social connection notifications through email, but it was still a largely browse and pull based experience. Whereas the mobile phone was just, you know, it was one where there was no sense of going online. You were always online. So it seemed obvious that all of the great social applications that were playing out on the web would be that much greater on the phone. But if you looked at the early days of, you know, the iPhone and the app store, all of the applications were sort of skeuomorphically focused on these single player applications. You know, it was the sort of the lighter application, and all of these silly little toys. And of course, that's a very common phase. A new technology platform is is built, and everyone skeuomorphically builds the thing that worked on the old technology platform. All the new applications look like toys. So we ended up being right on the importance of mobile as a sort of a much better native platform for connected applications. But the time it took for that to play out was longer than we expected. It almost killed the company. So that was sort of an explicit assumption. You know, an implicit assumption or something that we took for granted was how much founders and and builders and technologists were advantaged in that part of the new technology life cycle. And I've, I've sort of developed this theory over the years, Lex, which is that, you know, really leverage moves across functions and professions as product cycles and ecosystems mature. So if you look at the very early days of something like mobile at the time or or crypto a couple of years ago or Gen AI today, it's it's a world in which being a better technologist and understanding the technology better is the competitive advantage. You know, and then as the technology platform starts to stabilize, you see that being a better sort of product craftsperson starts to become the competitive advantage because the underlying technology really has stabilized. Everyone understands the capabilities. People understand less how those capabilities can be composed. That's the sort of early part of the life cycle. And I think that actually part is is very, very fulfilling and satisfying for most builders. Then as you move into sort of late stage product cycle, you start to see things like marketing really mattering because the products become commoditized, you know, or eventually BD and, and sort of corporate development and functions like that end up having the leverage. So one uh, one realization I've had over building my two companies is that you've really got to think about your sort of skill set and superpower and how well that matches up with where we are in the sort of technology maturity of the new technology life cycle. And for something like Gen AI, again, I think it's a perfect time to actually be a you know an engineer and a product person. I want to take a, a detour here and talk about 
platform shifts and get your thesis and view about platform shifts and maybe kick at the mental model a little bit. So you mentioned a couple, one of the largest ones being mobile, which opened up an incredible platform for others to build on and as a result had this incredible virality. And then social and certainly like early Facebook with its app store was a platform, although kind of less so now, or maybe different through the authentication stuff that Facebook leaned into instead. And then we have a number of these platform shifts in the category of things that add up to the metaverse, right? So in the category of AI, in the category of crypto and blockchain platforms and assets, and then in the category of augmented reality. And the lesson from these platform shifts, and you know, before that, the internet, and before that, desktops, desktop computing, the lesson from the platform shifts for investors and also large companies, and plugging that in again to your experience, like Amazon, right? That being a, a platform for e-commerce, these platform shifts send signals to developers and entrepreneurs to go and build familiar things, again, leveraging these new market venues or these new technology infrastructures or these new ways of being connected together, whether it's taking advantage of digital ownership on blockchains or whether it's taking advantage of, let's say, I don't know, the GPS on the mobile phone or the always internet on version of mobile apps. But not all platform shifts look like they've been made equal right? Like, I feel like there's been this acceleration of more and more new platforms for people to adopt and new paradigms in which to build. But the rate of adoption and sort of like the level of how meaningful they are in terms of disruption, I feel like has been really slowing down. And it's become more difficult to invest in a big platform shift and kind of get the same amount of return as you would from, you know, Apple's iPhone. What do you think I get right or wrong on this topic? Like, how do you think about this topic in the first place? And then how would you contextualize some of the modern platform shifts that everyone is looking at today? Yeah, I think it's a really interesting topic. I mean, one interesting question is simply, what is a platform? And Ben has covered this from Stratechery. I I like his definition, which is it's, you know, it's a, it's a sort of system in which the economic value that is captured by participants is greater than the economic value that's captured by the sort of operator of the platform. And I think that's an important definition because a lot of things are sort of thrown about and represented as platforms these days. Ultimately, platforms never, platform shifts rarely end up looking like the sort of prior shifts. You know, I would argue that Web 2.0 was actually an important platform shift and it wasn't a 10x in terms of new technology. There was a new technology paradigm that was introduced, but it was it was a sort of a new model for how you deliver applications to the consumer. Consumers develop new mental models for how they can interact with these applications. It was the early days of you know social and a social overlay in these web apps. So in a lot of ways, the, the platform shifts just always end up looking different than the prior shifts. And I think when we try to be too tightly held in how we fit the patterns of the past shifts to the future shifts, we tend to get it wrong. And this is why I think a lot of the focus on AR, VR, whether correct or incorrect, it just ended up being a little too on the nose after the mobile shift. Like everyone was thinking, oh, there's going to be a new piece of hardware with a new app store, you know, with a new monetization model, a new consumer interaction model. Maybe, maybe. But if you look at what's happened with the Gen AI thing, just in, I mean, it's been less than 12 months, things that we're seeing today that are becoming commonplace, you know, perhaps you and I would have said were impossible or near impossible 12 months ago. It just felt like it came out of nowhere. I would argue that this platform shift feels important enough to, you know, potentially double GDP. Like it it really does affect and impact everything at mobile scale at a minimum. So I don't know that I agree that the, the platform shifts are becoming less impactful. And if you look at the sort of period of 2009, 2010, really to 2020, yes, there have been some new sort of product cycles, of course, with technologies like Web3. But the major cycle that was playing out was the deployment and the sort of maturation of mobile. So I would argue that we sort of were in a lull and now we're in this gestation period where there are all of these new platforms that are really starting to hit their stride, like Web3, like Gen AI, after many years of sort of, you know, wandering in the darkness. 
So I don't know. I, I, I think that we have to be super open-minded as to what we imagine the next platform looks like and how value gets created and captured. I also think there are, you know, there, there's such a tendency to believe that these new platforms will by default be sustaining innovations for incumbents. That's certainly what happened with mobile. And you look at what's happening with Gen AI today, and there's a ton of discussion of, well, of course, Microsoft Office is going to integrate Gen AI into email and calendar and spreadsheets, and how can this not be a sustaining innovation for them? But I think the deeper question is, well, are those knowledge work artifacts even relevant in a world of Gen AI? You know, do we need email in the same way, especially when you know, GPT is generating an email to be sent so that GPT can summarize that email? You know, what are we really doing here? So again, I think as the, the sort of primitives change, the assumptions and the artifacts have to change, and that can shift our worldview from one in which a lot of the platforms are you know, enabling sustained innovation by incumbents to one in which it really is a place for startups to play. I had not expected to be watching Facebook deal with the innovator's dilemma and thrash about you know, in the way that it had trying to domain park on top of the word metaverse and then <laughs> re- and then you know like copy pasting the sort of like the mobile competition it is uncanny how some things just happen in cycles okay so getting back to your career you had founded a mobile focused company that which was then acquired by Google and then you had founded another company inside of Google which was spun out and acquired by Credit Karma can you talk about sort of your introduction or generally your background in fintech and then what is it that Credit Karma was interested in, you know, when it interacted with the company you founded and kind of why did it decide to acquire it? Absolutely. Yeah, you know, she just contrasts the two experiences. This kind of comes back to the framework I laid out earlier, which is that, you know, in the early phases of these product cycles like mobile or Gen AI, the you know, just building a better product, being a better technologist is actually what matters and the distribution tends to flow from that. So with the first company, Social Deck, you know, we did build a better product. We did invent a bunch of new technology capabilities. We quickly grew to two million MAU. You know, when we were acquired by Google, we were significantly larger than Google's social app, and, and I think you know I don't know that Google Plus Mobile ever became bigger than you know the number of MAUs that we had at our startup. So we got to real scale, but we didn't explicitly focus on distribution. We didn't have to. When we built the second company, Snowball, it, it, Snowball was a prosumer company. You know, we tried to apply the same playbook. We created a, a unified inbox for all of your mobile messaging apps. You know, Facebook, WhatsApp, Snapchat, etc. And we created a bunch of new technology to do it, but we sort of operated under an assumption that, hey, if we built a useful and interesting product that used novel technology, it would just get distribution. And in that case, it it very much didn't. And and that's really what got me thinking about how these markets shift and how, you know, even if you're able to create genuinely new products, when the markets mature, being able to actually be much more sophisticated at go-to-market and distribution is actually what matters. So the, the product never got to the scale that we wanted it to get to. And you know, we realized 18 months in that we probably wanted to land the company. So the acquisition by Credit Karma was a talent acquisition, you know, unlike our first acquisition, which was very much a product acquisition. And the reason that we went there was, you know, after, after spending a bunch of years of competing with and competing on behalf of the big core internet companies like Google, a friend of mine ended up going to Credit Karma and Nikhil Single to lead product. And when we sat down and talked about, one, the substantiality of the opportunities and problems in fintech, you know, like if you make things better for people as it pertains to their money, it, those are really significant changes in their lives. And two, if you look at the sort of competitive axis, I mean, you're either competing with no one or with banks who haven't been the most innovative as a fintech company. So it just felt like an exciting setup as a product leader and a builder. And we had some opportunities to, for example, go back to Google and and sort of pursue some more traditional paths with Snowball. And we ended up taking a leap of faith that FinTech was the place for us. And that's how we ended up there. And it turned out to be one of the best decisions of my career. Credit Karma is one of the few companies to reach scale in FinTech and not just on valuation, but on actual consumer usage, like it's a destination that lots and lots of people love. 
What kinds of lessons did you learn about people, about consumers while at Credit Karma? Like, what insights do you have about the financial life of somebody who uses that product? I think there's there's a couple of interesting insights. You know, the, the probably the overriding one is that you can't be paternalistic with consumers. And I think this is really the source of a lot of the challenges with consumer products as they're designed, which is there's a level of paternalism, which is that, hey, we know better and, hey, we're going to help prevent people from making bad choices. In reality, people, especially the working poor, have got very, very complex financial lives and they have to make a lot of real-time decisions. And, you know, they they have a, a mental model for how they're going to manage their money. In the margins, you can perhaps help them tune their model. But really, the goal is to help them to make the decisions that they're going to make anyway, but make those decisions be as efficient as possible. If they decided they need to take a personal loan, then you know you can help steer them to the lowest cost personal loan by telling them that they should be you know cutting their coffee or their lunch instead of getting a personal loan is just generally not a productive suggestion. So I think one one place of, of great sadness for consumer product builders in fintech has been this sort of area of paternalism and quote unquote education. You know, related education, I mean, something really important in fintech is that, look, most people don't want the education. They want the automation. They want someone, they don't, they don't want to go to the gym. They want someone to go to the gym for them. Like some people like to go to the gym, but most people would rather just press a button and have had someone go to the gym for them. So I think wherever you can replace education with automation, I think generally education is actually a misnomer. I just don't know that it's that productive or impactful. I think it's something that coming back to the paternalism point makes the sort of paternalists feel good, but I don't know that it's actually delivering enormous consumer value. And look, I think the third thing is actually, if you look at the credit score itself, you know, from a pure functional perspective, it's not used that often by most people. You know, you might apply for a product once or twice a year. So that, that sort of implies that the engagement at Credit Karma should be once or twice a year. And Credit Karma is indeed a super high retention product, but it's also a very high engagement product, which wouldn't be predicted by that. And the reason that I learned from my time there was that people are really seeking feedback on how they're doing. And the credit score is this sort of objective piece of feedback in a you know, very subjective world that tells you definitively, you know, you're doing okay, you're doing great, you're not doing so hot. And just that desire to get feedback is what drives a lot of the engagement loop and, and drives a lot of sort of behavior in consumer finance. So there's a, there's a ton of lessons for how consumers behave and think about their money, and, and none of them are the sort of obvious ones. And th- those are some of the things I learned at Karma. That's fascinating. I want to double click on that point. You can see this in a lot of companies and a lot of founders when they approach the market. My learning from the digital investing world is that most financial products cause people physical and psychic pain. You know, like interacting with a lending product or a mortgage or an investing interface or like, hey, you have to go buy a treasury right now or like, oh, your bank's totally fine is just now in a bridge bank structure owned by the government until another (laughs) bank buys it, you know, like it is an awful time and all the products are horrible and having to deal with it is a cost of immense proportion or at least, you know, $350, which is like the average customer acquisition cost. The only exception to this, as we know, which is weird and alarming to me and and drove a bunch of my decisions, is crypto assets. It is the one place where people spin themselves up and virally get obsessed with financial instruments. But in normal day-to-day regular finance, that's not the case. I want to learn a little bit more about this point of how you can avoid paternalistic products, i.e. asset allocation is good for you, diversification is good for you, trading too much is bad for you, too much credit is bad for you, don't take out the high interest rate loan, take out a low interest rate loan, but not too much. You know, How do you avoid that balance between not nagging people into submission but at the same time, not being irresponsible and creating like a Robin Hood type dopamine loop or a crypto type dopamine loop that kind of tricks the 
the internal systems to generate virality. So what are the ethical ways to kind of balance that line? And feel free to draw on the Credit Karma experience or any other, you know, as an investor at Andreessen, any other experiences or deals that you've looked at that might address that question. Yeah, I think that's a great question. And, you know, for what it's worth, I I have maybe a slightly more generous view of the psychology of a lot of sort of Web3 participants, which is, you know, I think for a lot of folks, it's a way of thinking about puzzles and solving puzzles. And I think that that, you know, the psychology of, of solving puzzles and problems, which happen to be in a financial domain, is really appealing to technologists and builders. I think that's a completely different mindset from, you know, people trying to solve their problems. And that's, it sort of speaks to two completely different segments of the market. You know, I think we all have a friend in our group, perhaps it's Ulex, who loves to optimize their financial life. And that friend is, it, it's typically less about the money and more about the puzzle for that person. But for the other four out of five people in the friend group, you know, money is just a, it's a sort of tool for them. And it's one that they'd rather not spend their entire day obsessing about. So there's a sort of puzzle mindset versus the problem mindset, which I think partially explains it. I think to your point about how we actually help folks end up making better decisions. You know, when I look at the Gen AI world, I think it's a great place to actually explore this. A ton has been made of, you know, chatbots, and you, you covered this in your recent post, which was really well done, I thought, in separating hype versus reality. But we're spending so much time talking about advice, and advice is another word for education. We're not talking enough about agents, I believe, and agency. So the, the magic of these sort of systems is that they can not just generate content or generate advice, they can also act on your behalf with reasonably good judgment. And this is where I think we can actually start to see a little bit of a 10x, which is, hey, you know, given the decisions that I've sort of already made or the intentions that I have, can you act on my behalf to intelligently optimize my debt, you know, think about my cash flow, help me to balance my investments? There's a lot that we can do there. I think that's part one. Look, I think part two is that you know, people like to spend a lot of money at Christmas. People like to have some YOLO stocks. There's just a part of human nature that's going to do things that, you know, we might in the abstract sit sort of tut tut and say is irresponsible. And as long as we bound those things, those things are okay and they're inevitable. I also think that there's a way for us to address some of those needs and, and really unbundle the sort of financial exposure. There's been so many companies that have tried to find this middle ground between a full delegation approach, which is, you know, in my view, the perfect delegator digital investing company, RoboAdvisor, is, you know, I'm a client. I don't want to think about my money or touch my money. It makes me unhappy. So I have an app. And when I open the app, it has a big smiley face and maybe little dollar signs for the eyes. That's, that's the whole app. That's, you know, every time I feel I need to check my money, that's what I get. And that's the perfect delegator experience. And then the, on the other side, you've got the self-directed experience, which is like somebody who's got 25 Bloomberg terminals and like Red Bull plugged into their veins (laughs) (laughs) on, on both crypto Twitter and Bloomberg chat at the same time. And, you know, these are caricatures, but the stuff in between is so hard to do. You look at these sort of active-ish or social following copy investor companies, and it's hard to find one that's worked. You know, I have old examples. I have Covester and Motif and Kaching Wealthfront, right? Like none of the sort of halfway companies have done it. The only one I've seen that sort of I'm persuaded by are maybe eToro a little bit, although I don't think that that's their bread and butter. And then maybe M1. Like I think M1's done a, quite a good job of finding a profile that's still active but diversified. Have you come across other examples of things that solve this? I think M1 and the new Wealthfront feature is a great call out actually because they allow you to take one idea and then they just make that idea better. So if you say, look, I'm interested in Tesla, then they can expand that to a portfolio of things that are indexed to sort of electrification and clean energy. 
So I think that is a, that's an excellent example of where it can take, you know, what would otherwise be exposure to a single stock position, which has all the downsides we both understand and building a little index around it. So you're still feeling the fulfillment of, you know, trading on your idea, but it's a little bit more intelligently done. I don't have a ton of examples though, Lex. I think you're, you're right that it's been hard to actually find the balance here. I also think, though, that this is a higher order problem than the one that we necessarily need to be solving. Like, if I look at the, the most simple, straightforward, non controversial way to unlock enormous value for the average American, it's simply to ensure that every single bit of debt that they have is efficiently priced. And if you actually just look at the math on how much Americans are overpaying for everything, And when I say overpaying, I don't mean, hey, if they improve their credit, they could get access to cheaper loan. I mean, you know, with their existing credit and their existing choices, they simply have access and they don't know it. They are overpaying on their mortgages, their auto loans, their auto insurance. So to me, that's actually a it's a mundane but incredibly important problem that is still unsolved. Let's go and optimize the cost of the consumer's debt and their balance sheet. And then let's move on to figuring out, you know, copy trading and and how we put the right guardrails around ideas like that. Let's move on to your work with Andreessen, where you've been a GP since late 2019. What kinds of things are you interested in or were interested in? I'd love to talk about party round, but before getting there, what kind of thesis did you have coming into that role? And then how has that thesis evolved over I guess, essentially COVID, Web3, NFTs, and now generative AI? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I'll say that the area that I had the most interest in coming into Andreessen that I probably have spent a little less time on is just consumer. I'm very passionate about consumers. You know, I spent most of my career in consumer, both consumer fintech and sort of prosumer social. So I've always been excited about the idea of creating positive sum outcomes for consumers via fintech. And I still think a lot of those problems are unsolved. Uh, You know, I I sort of have a theory that we just haven't been ambitious enough in some of the consumer fintech products we've been building. You know, we've had a lot of sort of banker archetypes building these products. Maybe we need more people with nose rings building these products. We can talk about that in a moment. But consumer was probably my, my biggest area of focus coming into in recent and it's just been less investable than I had hoped. And part of that is I caught the sort of tail end of what was a big explosion in consumer fintech companies. Part of it was a real challenge with the distribution channels. This is why I've been so interested in the Gen AI as applied to Google and, and discovery. Because it does feel like the, the sort of Google auction monetization model is one of the big things that's holding back consumer fintech at scale. That's probably the biggest delta between, you know, where I was when I joined and where I am today. Today, I'm still, of course, interested in consumer and and making consumer investments. There have been less of those, but I've always been very focused on software-led products versus financially-led products. You know, I kind of came in with a theory, which I've retained, and that is that, you know, there's two definitions of fintech. One is it's banking, it's lending, it's insurance, it's sort of a set of products, and The broader definition, which I'm more interested in, is fintech as a business model, an emerging business model for internet companies. And I think in that framing, you can sort of take a much broader view of fintech. That's really what drove my investment in a bunch of default global companies. I find the idea that fintech is a way to just monetize just so interesting, you know, because I grew up in the finance world and there's just like such a pleasure about having finance collapsed into a feature of actual economic activity that people care about. It's very consistent and feels correct in terms of where it should be prioritized or how it should be applied. But it's so contrary to how financial firms think about the world having always pushed products and having had kind of a monopoly on distribution and now being folded into various shapes and pretzels that support these very different business models. Let's touch on generative AI since you've brought it up. One of the things that seems to be emerging is that, or at least my conclusion on the space, is that it's not that generative AI will be integrated into lots of other footprints, including financial prints, but rather that everything else, including financial footprints and monetization through financial products, will be integrated into the interface of generative AI. And maybe there's going to be a couple of those that that win, but that people who are thinking about how do I integrate into that voice 
are likely to be ahead over those who are thinking about how do I do my old thing, but with, you know, with robots in the middle. What do you think about that statement? And then can you open up like your investment thesis around Gen AI and fintech? Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I, I, you know, I couldn't agree more. And a great way to look at this is if you just look up, you know, best rewards card for a person with near prime credit, take a look on Google. I mean, there's two issues with Google. One is that the, the query is so compromised by the monetization model that it's impossible to even wade through all the results to know what's an ad, what's not, you know, what's authoritative, what's not. And even if you actually get past all the monetization, it's just, there's, there's a lot of synthesis that you need to actually do to come up with an answer. And you know, GPT does a pretty good job of just giving you the answer. It's not perfect, but it's, it's very rapidly approaching you know, exactly what you would need to make a decision. So I think the idea of you know, FinTech and financial services being integrated into this experience is the right one versus you know, what we've seen with Microsoft and Edge. It, it, it's fine, it's a little too on the nose and it's sort of not clear to me that, that this is a, a long-term durable like search and the need to find this information versus, hey, just go do the right thing on my behalf seems like the end game of all of this. So it's sort of not clear to me that we actually need this interim interaction model. So I think you're right about that. In terms of FinTech and Gen AI, you know, as I said, there's sort of three types of Gen AI as I see it. You know, there's the truly generative stuff, which you know is is very widely discussed, and I think that's interesting and fine. My partner Christina wrote a great post about what she called synth AI, which is the ability to actually synthesize large amounts of information into something very succinct. I think that's an important concept for fintech and financial services. But again, I think the most important concept, which isn't being discussed at all as far as I see, is the idea of agents and agency. You know, the idea of giving an agent your power of attorney and saying, hey, go make good decisions on my behalf. Go see if I have the cheapest home and auto insurance. And if I don't, you know, just change it for me. So I think the idea of intelligent agents that can act on your behalf and sort of come back either for an opt-in or eventually an opt-out or, or perhaps none at all is the actually correct mental model for fintech plus gen AI. And that's a longer term model, Lex. I think in, if you look at the sort of short-term model, even something like credit counseling, you know, I can sit down and walk through someone's credit report with them in 10 minutes and explain all the nuances and help them to make some good decisions about what to pay off and why. And that's just such a difficult experience to deliver digitally. So I know it's sort of mundane to just talk about the ability to interact with, you know, natural language interface, but the idea of a sort of natural language command line interface to many of your financial problems, which are you know, relatively well understood and mundane, I think is actually a really important improvement for FinTech. We would expect to see then maybe within the interface of a big tech AI offering, some sort of plugin that is the investments plugin. And so you get to have a conversation with, let's just say, Goldman Sachs investment advisor, GPT. Or similarly for the credit karma conversation, but within that AI interface, are those the kinds of companies you're looking for when you're evaluating the sector? Right now, I think the application model is too unstable to know exactly what the, you know, to say that is exactly the kind of company. I think spiritually, that's right. I think the right application model is going to involve both one of these interfaces potentially provided by big tech, but it needs to be complemented by you know, an engine that can capture and manage all of your personal data, as well as an engine that can sort of act on your behalf, you know, keep a record of that. So I do think that there's the sort of core LLM, perhaps with financial plugins from Goldman, or you know, that may remind you of Goldman. But I also think that the model needs to be extended to do things like you know, to protect and manage your personal data as well as act on your behalf. So I think that that, you know, that application model and what it actually looks like is still coming together. There's a real question of how do you actually build you know, durable enterprise value in a world in which you know, anyone can plug into the same model. So I, I don't know what the actual end game looks like. I think those are the sort of the, what you described are the correct attributes of the types of companies I want to invest in. But as to what they actually look like architecturally, I don't think anyone can answer that question yet. In adjacent futurology, ownership. You know, so right now it feels that the AI direction is orthogonal to the Web3 direction, where 
AI is almost sort of the maximal interpretation of Web2 industry structure, right? Like not only content isn't like asymptotically free, it is actually free and it's actually infinite and it's actually molded so perfectly around our brains and entirely made by machine. And then the sort of 90 degrees from that is privacy, digital ownership, all the things that for people who like blockchain and Web3, the things that we come back to. And then even, you know, the idea of what you're talking about is like, if I have an agent that knows me, knows all my financial data and is out there on my behalf negotiating discounts with various lenders, I would sort of like to own that agent in my wallet. I don't really want that agent to be, you know, Goldman Sachs AI division or, you know, Goldman Sachs Bridge Bank Federal Reserve AI division. (laughs) So how do you think these things come together what's possible? Yeah, I think that the the Web3 world, you know, as an outsider, I don't spend my time in Web3. We have a team that looks at that. But as an outsider, to me, it feels like exactly the right system. You know, it absolutely makes the right trade-offs at the system level. And it has the sort of right implications from a permissionless perspective, I think, for the world that we live in. And I love your framing of, of Gen AI being the sort of logical conclusion of everything web two, because I do think that from a systems perspective, you know, we're already talking about everything around safety and quote unquote alignment. And I do think that that actually, you know, the fact that it's so heavily permissioned and there's already such a strong sort of political policy overlay is the biggest risk to the technology achieving its potential benefits. If you sort of take a step back and look at our society, you know, what are the ways that we can dramatically increase you know, GDP and our quality of life. It's either dramatically increased population growth, which we haven't done an amazing job of in the West, certainly lately. It's dramatically increased natural resource extraction, which you know, there's a, a thousand reasons why that's probably not going to happen. And the third is dramatically increased productivity through technology. But that actually means that we have to be willing to embrace the technology and do that. And you know, when I see Gen AI, I think if if sort of allowed to reach its logical conclusion, it has profound implications in terms of creating abundance for the average person. It's sort of unclear to me that we as a society are going to let it get all the way out. And I think that in a world of, of sort of Web3, that's not something that someone can take away from us as a society. I want to ask you, in addition to some of the themes that we covered, what are the things that you find the most interesting from an investment perspective around financial services and consumer? Like, what are the things on the radar that maybe aren't in the mainstream narratives, but are meaningful to your investment practice? Yeah, the two areas that I'm excited about. So to start with, to start with consumer, I've been interested in multiplayer fintech forever. I don't know what that means exactly. There are some historical examples like Roscas that I've, I've talked about in the past that I think are really interesting. But this was my comment about you know less bankers, more people with nose rings building in consumer fintech. If consumer fintech is a sort of substrate and a business model, and ultimately you know money is a sort of medium of exchange between people, I do think that we've sort of underbuilt the idea of social multiplayer fintech, and I think that there's going to be a very large consumer fintech company that gets built in that world. So that's an area I've been actively looking out for companies building in for the last few years. In terms of you know, enterprise and non-consumer, the big area of focus for me has been the concept of default global. And the idea there, Alex, is that you know, historically companies were very local in how they did everything. They hired locally, they sold locally, at least to start. They sort of, you know, the product was in one language, they accepted one currency. And what changed during COVID was, you know, companies started to hire across borders, they started to sell across borders, and they started to become global on day one, which was a very new thing. The other trend impacting this is, you know, what I mentioned earlier around fintech as a business model for internet companies. Even though these companies want to be global on day one, fintech has been default local historically, you know, local consumer preferences local sort of regulatory constraints, sort of local payment instruments, all of that. So the idea of building and investing in infrastructure that allows companies to be global, hiring, selling, and operating on day one is a big, big focus area for me. Thank you for opening up all of these ideas. Fascinating. 
if our audience wants to learn more about you or about Andreessen and the fintech practice, where should they go? Yes, they can absolutely email me, anisha at a16z.com, or they can hit our fintech page, a16z.com slash fintech. We do a ton of reading and writing and thinking. We're very transparent in everything that we're sort of looking at and interested in. That's a great place to go and, and sort of catch up on all the latest. Fantastic. Anish, it's been a real pleasure having you on the podcast. Lex, it's been a ton of fun. Let's do it again soon. Thank you. Hi, everyone. That's it for this week's episode of the Fintech Blueprint. For more technical deep dives into all things fintech and decentralized finance, check out fintechblueprint.com and grab a free subscription to the newsletter. This is Lex, and I'll see you next time. <music>